Hi, I'm Dr. Mimi Guarneri, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Pacific Pearl La Jolla Legacy Series. This series is about bringing luminaries of health and healing to the forefront, individuals who have transformed the way we think about treating the whole person, body, mind, emotions, and spirit. The Legacy Series is funded by the Miraglow Foundation, thanks to grants from the Taylor Advised Endowment Fund. At Pacific Pearl La Jolla, we believe that healing people and changing lives comes from the wisdom of all global healing traditions. This series brings to you those individuals whose shoulders we stand on as we practice integrative holistic medicine today. Hi, I'm Dr. Mimi Guarneri, and it is my pleasure today to welcome Deborah Zake. We're filming live at Pacific Pearl in La Jolla, California. Deborah Zake has been a lifelong warrior for wellness. In fact, the Huffington Post has hailed her as the godmother of wellness. Last year, the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine awarded her the highest honor for pioneering the entire health and wellness industry as we know it today in North America. Deborah has a huge list of accolades. At the age of 94, she has been an organic farmer since the 1930s. She has been a vegetarian since the age of four. She has run for Congress, served on the President's Council of Physical Fitness, for Presidents Nixon, Reagan, and Ford. She has served as a delegate for UNESCO. But it doesn't stop there. Deborah is known as an activist. In 1978, she founded COMBO, Combined Arts and Educational Council of San Diego, where she raised over $25 million to support 21 cultural organizations. She raised over $6 million alone in 1978 to rebuild the Old Globe Theater in San Diego. Deborah is not shy to politics. She ran as a Republican in San Diego in 1982 for Congressional District Council. From 1984 to 1990, she served as the president of the Inter-American Foundation, an independent foreign assistant agency of the United States government, which fosters grassroots development by awarding grants directly to the organized poor in struggling countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. She founded the Eureka Community in 1991, a national leadership training program for CEOs of nonprofit organizations. But what Deborah is most known for is her work in the health and wellness industry. And that goes back to founding Rancho La Puerta, which she started with her husband, Edmund, in 1940. It's my absolute privilege and pleasure to welcome Deborah Zake. Deborah is not only someone who was born in Brooklyn, New York, as was I. She is the prominent Southern California area activist and philanthropist. And when I say activist, I mean it. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you, thank you. You know, that so much about you that I feel like we need to start from the beginning. Because on May 3rd, you just celebrated your 94th birthday, which is pretty extraordinary since you came running in here this morning, had a smoothie, and now you're ready to, to go with the interview. So how do you manage to do it all? Tell us a little bit about you. Well, this morning I woke up. I always wake between 5 and 6. And I made a huge list of things because I'm going to Europe in a month and I made a list of everything I had done before that. 
And there's columns and columns and columns. This one will do this, and this one will do this, and this one will do this, and this one me will do. Um, because at the same time, I'm emptying out storerooms because I moved a year ago. And I've put everything in a storeroom. This will go with the art, and this will go there. And when you downsize to half the size house, half the number of walls, so I decided, so this morning I was actually putting timelines. Okay. Just paper and pencil. Yeah, paper and pencil, easy for you to say. <laughs> Now, I love that you're now known as the godmother of wellness. And I have to tell you, uh, it is absolutely true. When I think about you, I credit you with starting the entire wellness industry. And I'm wondering if you can share with us a bit of that journey. It's hard, <coughs> hard to know where to begin. I began, it was raised in a health nut family. <laughs> and when there was a depression in New York, and we were living in Brooklyn, and we were moderately wealthy Jewish family. My dad was partner in a women's cloak and suit factory. And I say, and when I say moderately wealthy, my brother and I both had our own nannies. Mm -hmm. And we were busy learning several languages and having that, you know, like, you know Montessori school and all the good stuff. Uh, came the depression. Dad lost his money. And my mom was different. She was vice president of the New York Vegetarian Society. She had already converted us into being health nuts. And as a result, there was only bananas to eat in all of Brooklyn. Day after day, when there was nothing. Wow. I don't know why people stopped growing things or what I was, you know, seven or eight, you know, who knows. <laughs> I didn't think, you know, you do what your parents say and you read a lot and you live in land of fairy tales and books and you don't know exactly what's going on or do, do you care at that time, at that age. In any case, my mom came home one day and my brother and I both say, remember it the same way, so it was probably true. She came and said at dinner, she said, uh, we're leaving. And my dad said, what? And she said, yes, we're leaving in 16 days. Where to? Tahiti. Where's that? I don't exactly know, but here are the tickets. That's unbelievable. And we had to go through the Panama Canal. I mean, it was, you know, in those days, yeah. it was a long journey. And then from San Francisco, 10 days by boat. Um, and from Brooklyn, which was at that time very gray. And I do remember seeing the men in the red line. And it was just really dreary. He was... <laughs> Technicolor, everything was bright and fun and joyous, and the weather and... And the water, and, that beautiful yeah, water. And my life changed forever. Okay, so this is a special mom, because yeah. I don't know too many people who were vegetarian at the time, who raised their children vegetarian. I mean, what year are we talking about, 1930s? Um, I, we became vegetarian when I was four years old. Okay. So, 1926. So you have been vegetarian for 90 years. No, I eat fish and have for many, many years. Okay. But I do not eat red meat and I do not eat chicken, except once in a blue moon when I'm stuck and there's nothing else. Right, right. Instead of starving, you have a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so mom takes you to Tahiti. Dad didn't even know about it. Well, <laughs> by the, my dad was very depressed and very, yeah. you know, he'd lost everything. And, right. And, and so what happened in Tahiti? He made a lot of money. An entrepreneur is an entrepreneur. But basically, we were there for five years. Unbelievable. And uh, I was a bookworm. I would play with the kids, with the girls, and... I'd be bored. I wasn't interested in what they were talking about. And so I read all of Dickens, and a good part of Shakespeare. Can't say all. They didn't have all his plays, so I might have read all. 
I read things like H. Ryder Haggard, which was a, you know, I mean, I read it. You read everything. I yeah. spent my, I went to school, and in between, I read. And I, a lot of the person I am is because I continue reading a lot. And so I'm self-educated. But books are wonderful for that. Books are amazing. There's no doubt about it. In any case, uh, we stayed there for five years. And... Um, Dad made money from copra, which he'd never seen a coconut in his life before, but <laughs> Good for figured him. it out. <laughs> and we came back to the Bay Area, and we lived in a series of places in San Francisco. Mother was keep, kept on trying to find better weather. <laughs> <laughs> and so every six months, we moved to a different school, and finally we settled in Mill Valley. And we stayed there through graduation through graduation of high school. High school. So dad is an example to everyone that when life gives you lemons, make lemonade, or in this case, coconuts. <laughs> yeah. And it's pretty amazing since most people uh, didn't have the courage to pick up and leave during the Depression. Well, he didn't do it. Mom did that. Well, Mom, Mom did he, it. he was one of his best friends. Uh, in those days, they call it falling under train, mm -hmm. you know. And um, Mom was worried about him, yeah. and so and yeah. he just sort of, you know, was very glad to have direction at that time. Right. Well, they say the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree, so I think you are, are coming right from your mom's lineage and uh, DNA. To a great degree. Well, sounds that way. So, uh, okay, you graduate high school, and you you've been a vegetarian. Uh, and you've had this incredible uh, eye-opening Tahitian experience, which I think is an amazing gift. And now you're learned because you've been reading. And all of a sudden, you go on another little path. No, it didn't happen quite that thing. Okay. <laughs> uh, in Tahiti, we met a remarkable man, Edmund Seike. He was a philosopher. Uh, he was well-read, and he had created... Uh, something called, which he called cosmotherapy. Cosmic therapy? Cosmotherapy. Cosmotherapy. Cosmoth uh, cosmic therapy would be even grander. I, well, <laughs> it's possible. Yeah, <laughs> but no, cosmotherapy okay. was grand enough. But a worldview. Mm -hmm. And he was, in which he felt that we had abandoned the ancients' wisdom. Mm. And uh, everything was new, 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 and there was so much of great value. And he felt that we should pull from the ancients. But not only the ancients from one era, but from many eras. And uh, in any case, Mom met with, met with him and she, I was just a kid in school, I mean, but my mom was fascinated by Edmund Seike, Professor Seike, we called him. And uh, she started studying with him in Tahiti. And when Dad, Dad had gone home back to San Francisco six months earlier, and when Dad, uh, so that he could lose his money again, actually, he got, went back too soon and he bought a chain of dress shops in, five, uh, in four western states, four or five western states and promptly lost his money again because the Depression wasn't fully over Quite yet. Quite over, right. But in any case, uh, Dad said, come back, uh, you know, it's come time to come back to the States. And uh, Mother reluctantly agreed, but she said to Professor Seike, if you come there, we're going to be in San Francisco. Here's our address. I hope you'll stop by. And he did. And then he said, I'm on my way to Elsinore, California, and I'm going to be having a summer school there. He was a teacher and would have periodic summer schools. And since we had no plans, family had no plans, my mother and dad, we ended up in Elsinore, California, and we continued a friendship. So when I graduated from high school, I went to Tamil Pies High in Mill Valley, we just, my parents decided we'd not been in Mexico and to, and to Guadalajara, and let's go visit the professor over Christmas. 
And that's when my next life started. I've had a series of lives. Mm -hmm. But my next life really started there because we went to Guadalajara. And we arrived as his secretary, who was the translator of his books and everything. So we was packing because Purcell's dad had died, and they had sent for him. His dad was quite important in the circle, and he had to go home. And the idea was we would stay. Edmund Seke was a very special man. He was able to manage never to drive a car, never to type, never to pick up a train ticket and do this or that. He always had secretaries mm -hmm. because okay. he was writing, he was thinking, yeah. he was studying, yeah. and he couldn't be bothered mm -hmm. <laughs> with those I things. That's a good lesson. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, so his secretary was packing, and the decision was my brother had to go back to school, my dad had to go back to work. Uh, we would wait until the secretary arrived, my mother and I. Well, the secretary arrived. He was a tall, handsome Hungarian youth. His name was Bela. He looked around Guadalajara at that time, which was dirty and poor. Mm -hmm. And he did something very unusual. He got on the same train he got off because it went on to Mexico City, and it had a three-hour layover in Guadalajara. And he vanished. And so Mom said, let's... my." Dad then wrote to get another secretary from the States and wasn't happening and mom and we were there and dad was saying, Come home, you know, we didn't have email and Skype right, and all those right. things that in those exist. days. Right. So it was all done by wire. And the telephone was too expensive in those days. Anyhow, uh, somewhere about that, not quite how it all happened. But I had graduated 16 from high school, and Mom wasn't anxious for me to start college right away. Now they call it a gap year. Right, exactly. It's quite acceptable. But in those days, Mom, since he was looking for a secretary, Mom thought it would be a very good experience for me. I would be getting a small stipend, have a little sort of with the, it was a studio, uh -huh. a little right. studio, because yeah. it had a little gas ring and became a studio. Mm -hmm. And I would have my own space. And mom said, well, why don't you be the secretary? And dad wasn't keen on it, but mom had it. Seems like mom made a lot of those decisions. <laughs> and so mom went home, and it was arranged that a year later, I would come home at Christmas to go to college. And by this time, I was 17. Well, on the train, going back to L.A., uh, my, we, we, my parents were in uh, San Francisco, but we were going to, back to L.A. where he would, had been staying. Uh, he proposed, and I thought he was the most wonderful man in the world, and I said, yes. And that's the next and, part. <laughs> yeah, so then started another life. And uh, we were going to go back to England, where my husband was, had been on leave of absence from the British International Health and Education Society in Leatherhead in Surrey, just outside of London. And I was going to go to college. I mean, it was a nice plan. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to find a boat that wasn't being sunk, because it was very hard to get to England because the war had started. Right. And uh, there we were, and still trying to get to England, because we didn't have any money. He was <laughs> supposed to be working. His leave of absence of one year was over, uh -huh. and he had been on sabbatical. And so we were getting really pretty worried, but again, something that made us forget all our worries. We got a letter from... The, my husband was Hungarian from Transylvania, part of Hungary, that at World War I had been given to Romania. And we got a letter from the Romanian embassy, got a series of letters from the Romanian embassy, ordering him to report to his regiment. Romania had signed up on the side of Hitler. Mm. And my husband was Jewish, as I am. Mm -hmm. 
And he was, there was only two Jews in his graduating university class. Wow. I mean, that's how many Jews went to the university yeah. in those days. Anyhow, everyone for two summers, for two weeks, marched. They were officially in the army. And that's how they got numbers of army. Right. By having all the university students march for two summers, for two weeks, and they had numbers. Well, his unit was called up. He was ordered to return and fight. And, uh, of course, we weren't going to do... I, I was newly wed. I went to Washington to explain the situation. No one would... I said, if he went to Romania, they'd kill him. Right. I mean, and he's, he's married to an American, et cetera, et cetera. You know, he did everything. And then we got a letter finally, and this started the life, saying, if he was found in the United States June 1st, 1940, he would be arrested as a deserter oh boy. and sent back to his country. And he was a deserter. He definitely, I mean, he deserted the Romanian army, any way you look at it. But you'd think somebody in Washington would look a little deeper. And put two and two together, right. But they would never did understand during the Roosevelt years, the only thing, they didn't understand the Jewish situation. Obviously not. Or they decided to overlook it because that's when the Holocaust and right. all that stuff happened and six million Jews were doing this. So in any case, uh, we had to be out of the country. And we didn't have money. We had had a final check from England of a thousand pounds, which was two thousand dollars in those days, and that was it. They said we can no longer send money out of England. You have to come to England, but we couldn't get a boat to England. There weren't planes right. in those days, right, right. flying passengers. In any case, we had to be out of the country, and so Baja California was closest. I wanted to be on the border so that if we needed things. Right, you can come I, I back. I can back and forth. And my parents could move to San Diego, which they subsequently did. And the rest really is history. We picked Ticati for the climate and has mm -hmm. a superb climate. We could have looked at, we did look at Tijuana. Thank God we didn't pick it because the place we were looking at is now surrounded by the border <laughs> structure. Right, right. And we looked at Mexicali at the weather, and Ticati was the finest of the climates, and then actually a Mediterranean climate has a great climate, as similar to San Diego, which has a great climate. Yeah. We know that. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, so we got to Ticati with very little money, and uh, without a lot of planning, and a friend had given us as a wedding present in 1928, Cadillac, with crystal vases and plush seats. <laughs> Sounds like something else. Well, she was trying to get had. rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> and we, you know, anyhow, she gave us this car, and we had it loaded with, and we put boxes on the back, and with everything we owned, we arrived in Ticati, and my husband rented what I used to think was $50 a month it turned that was fifty dollars a year. A little adobe hut in the middle of nothing where they stored their hay. It had no windows, no doors. We put in shutters. I mean we didn't have glass windows right. fitted. We just put in when we left we would put in wooden shutters and sort of fasten them into the wall. And the house didn't have a threshold. It was just, it was where they stored hay. And uh, he rented this little house, and it had an outhouse, and there was a well, a good well. And we started Rancho La Puerta from nothing. And I'm very proud of when I think of back on those days. Well, you should be proud, and it's amazing to hear the story because when we think about we, we, don't, we didn't live through that, my generation. We came later, obviously. Mm -hmm. But to have lived through the war, to know what it is to have absolutely nothing, to pack everything up you have in a car, 
and go to Mexico and start from absolutely zero. But there's something magical about it. We were doing what we were supposed to do. Talk about that. There's a sacred mountain, uh, Mount Kuchima. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was that. I don't know what. But if the professor had married an ordinary uh, young woman from any place, it wouldn't work. I had already, all these years, been cooking on a wood stove. We had grown our own vegetables. Right. You know, I had carried water right. in, from, in, at the ranch. We had a well that we carried, but in Tahiti we carried it further, my brother and I, because the water, there was a little creek ran by our house. That's where you could wash dishes, but you had to get sweet water from the others, from, you know, a quarter mile away, and we used to carry it in five-gallon cans right. for drinking water. Uh, I had already lived... A, Five years in Tahiti without, with kerosene lamps, no toilets, no running water, no this, no that. So that I was already, knew what to do. I knew more than he did, actually. He'd never lived right. <laughs> that long a time. <laughs> and when he lived in Tahiti, yes, he had kerosene lamps and outhouses, but we were there for five years. I was raised that way. Right. And so by this time... Uh, I didn't want to say it was a piece of cake because it wasn't a very sweet cake. <laughs> but, but it was but a cake nonetheless. <laughs> I, but I knew, you know. And um, we were able to get guests that very first year, $17.50 a week, bring your own tent. How did you advertise? How did people know? Well, my husband had been in the habit of doing summer schools. Okay. And so he had a summer school scheduled for the States. We were going to be in Elsinore, California. Uh, and everything was all set up. He had uh, found a sort of shabby motel that he, mm -hmm. that he could lease for doing his summer school. Because he, they did healthy exercise at that time. They did the diet at that time. They did all these things already in his summer school. And my mother had attended one in, as a, in Elsinore, California, and before, and this was again in Elsinore. So everything, so we just wrote the people, it was going to be less expensive, right? and they had to just bring their own tent, and they came, because they had already had their summer plans, and they wanted to study with my husband. My husband was a magnet. He was a well-known writer philosopher in a certain circle. Right. And so we had people come from England. He had a following. Yeah. He had a following. And uh, so people say, which is true, they came for the professor. They came for his, every afternoon he would lecture at 4 o'clock. And I, because I had just recently been in high school, I organized a schedule so that the people weren't underfoot. So they, and, and they all had to, they paid 70 or 50 a week, and they worked two and a half hours a day. So I had it just like, like a school like a work class. schedule. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's still followed by all the spas every place. So, so tell us about what was a week at Rancho La Puerta like at $17.50? What was, what was a week like? What did you do? It, oddly enough, it's very much the same. We had a river, we still have a river, but now it's polluted and a tiny trickle. But we had a wonderful river. Mm. And we dammed with a mule and brush, we dammed it so that at the dam, the dam washed out every winter, I mean in the summer, mm -hmm. you know, with winter rains. But in the summer, which is when, what we had, and at the dam, it was six foot deep, and it backed oh, up. Nice. So mm -hmm. the people had two sessions of water exercise. They swam down to the dam, or walked down, swam down, because it about a long block, maybe two blocks. And then they had to walk back through the water, so it was an exercise program. 
And they did that twice a day. So they had water aerobics twice a day. <laughs> exactly. Uh, they climbed the mountain in the morning, and we climbed the mountain in the morning to greet the sun. We were originally called the Essene School. Professor found great values in the Essenes, who were an early Jewish sect. Absolutely. And Jesus and John the John Baptist, the Baptist right. and John the Beloved were supposed to have been Essenes, Essenes according right. to a lot of literature. And it's confirmed by the Essene scrolls to a great degree. Anyhow, so we would, in the morning, uh, first thing in the morning, the guests would go up on the hill. We're just talking about 15 to 20 guests. Right. They would go up on uh, first rock, and they would greet the morning sun. So they've had that exercise. I didn't get to do that. I was doing breakfast down yeah, below. You were getting ready <laughs> <I was doing. laughs> when they came back. Yeah. But everything was done with a wood fire, and so you have to start your fire earlier to be able to cook your oatmeal. And on the days that we had frumenti, which is whole grain wheat, uh, that was easy because I would cook it in a pressure cooker. At night, I would leave it. Right. And it would be ready. And yeah. it was warm and ready in the morning. And so we would have whole grains. Mm -hmm. And we were milking. We had goats, lots of goats. And... So we had our goat milk and whole grains and local honey. Uh, the local people would find, and they don't anymore, but there used to be bees because it was more rain. In the rocks would be hives, and mm -hmm. they would bring yeah. honey. And uh, so we would have grains and honey and goat milk for breakfast. Sounds good. And we did our own kind of sanka. In, in other words... We did our own coffee, right. of slightly burnt uh -huh, grains, a uh -huh. mix of grains. <laughs> and the thing is, I don't remember the recipe, but people liked it. It was a combination of soybeans and barley and wheat, and all, everything toasted right. You know, right. in a pan. Sounds and if good, you burnt actually. it slightly, yeah. it wasn't very good. But otherwise, anyhow, so that was breakfast. And then everyone had to work two and a half hours, and they worked in the garden. So you were growing your own vegetables. Yeah. We started the garden the day we moved in. Mm -hmm. First thing we did that very first day was start the garden. And I'd been gardening. Yeah. You know, life was so you were comfortable <laughs> with that. Well, I was comfortable bossing people to do it. <laughs> I was busy. But in any case, um, so that was breakfast. And they had the river. And then they would help, because they were working two and a half hours, I would assign different tasks and helping prepare because they learned cooking by practice. Mm -hmm. right. And so they alternated. Uh, everybody came for three weeks, and you would have one week in kitchen. One week we started a library right away, being a library and working. My husband would lecture every afternoon at 4 o'clock and they would transcribe the lectures uh, on a typewriter, and they would mimeograph them. So mm -hmm. one group were doing the mimeograph, which we then mailed out to various people and charged $10 a year, but we had eventually 300 members. Wow. And that was, that was how the ranch was built from wow. the membership. Yeah. But in any case, so everybody had assigned tasks, and uh, they all came back every summer. Well, it sounds to me almost like an ashram. It was. <laughs> that or a co-op. <laughs> One or the other. Yeah. So this is really the birth probably of the first vegetarian cooking school, yeah. would you <laughs> say? <laughs> yes, indeed. And that was vegetarian. We didn't do a lot of cooking. Uh, the only cooking I did was the grains in the morning and dinner. And I usually did just a great soup, period. Mm -hmm. You could have variety. That We didn't have much money. We used lots of beans. And uh, we did everything except I would, my dad sent us $300 every month. And I would go to San Diego, and I was driving a Jeep in those days, a war surplus Jeep. And I would buy potatoes and onions and two, three kinds of beans and rice. I mean, all those dry stuff. And that was for the month. 
we fed our guests on $300 a month and plus local milk and honey and vegetables. But this is still a way to exist today. Yeah. This is a healthy way of being. And yeah. it's, it's kind of funny because people always say to me, you, you, know, you, you, you should buy cheap food because you know, packaged foods and things are cheaper and you can go to a fast food place. And I always say, get some beans and get some lentils and yeah. get an yeah. onion and some carrots and you can go a long way on that. Yeah. And rice. So that's the birth of Rancho La Puerta. It's also the birth, really, of the health and wellness industry the way we know it, isn't it? Yeah, and actually, to a great degree, it's, um, we used to call us the first European spa in America in our early ads in the LA Times. And after 10 years, we were charging the huge sum of $9 a day. We had little... Uh, I had 30 boxes that had been uh, war surplus that we made into cabins by that time. Mm -hmm. And we were round, year round by that time. And uh, we still had one of the boxes as a sample for guests to look at <laughs> from the old days. And That's when we do the morning tour, the new guest tour, we always show them where it all began. Now, you are at the ranch and s still today teaching, what, once every, a week? I, yeah, I'm there every Tuesday. And I meet with some of the guests. But the main thing is I meet with the presenters, and we do something unique. We have most wonderful people, including Nobel Prize winners and, every, right. and wonderful writers and philosophers. Who, every night there's a presenter. And we also have a wonderful musical program, classical musical. Although jazz, consider jazz as classics because we have classic, great jazz. Wow. <laughs> you know, it's not just, you know, it's not just kids. Yeah. You know, no. it's adults who were symphony, whose hobby is jazz. Wonderful. Symphony players, so it's really great. Um, and so I meet with the presenters and then... Uh, at, at six, and then at eight, we have I lecture every Tuesday. And because 80% of my guests are returnees, I really have to read and study and be ahead of the curve. Well. So it takes work. So my reading is uh, focused. I don't have much time for reading for pleasure because I watch what the new books, what the new studies, use some of them, and from my husband, use some of the ancient wisdom because mm -hmm. his work influenced my work greatly, to put it mildly. And uh, we have 450 staff. Most of them, not most, but a good many are second and some are third generation. We it's have terrific. been there that long. And our wellness staff, who are American, uh, they've been, they come forever. I mean, in other words, they don't leave. They, they say, why should we? This is the best place to work. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well I've been there. It's extraordinary. Rancho La Puerta is extraordinary. So I can't let you go without having you talk for a little bit about your activism, your ability to organize, your wellness warrior project. I mean, there are so many things about you uh, that this is almost one small piece. Uh, but the other piece is so intriguing to me uh, because it really is uh, about, to me, who you are. It's the essence of your strength and your core. Well. When I turned 60, my son came back from Cornell. And that was my big year. And when I lecture, I talk about the three thirds. The first third is growing up and getting an education. This comes from Japanese literature. First third is growing up and getting an education. Second third is marriage, children, money. And the third third at 60 is emancipation. You paid your debt to society. You've raised your family, you've got your mortgage under control, and et cetera, et cetera. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> and at 60, 
you can do anything you want. You're an adult. Finally, you've grown up. You have had all these experiences. They're there with you forever. And so at 60, my son came home from Cornell. Uh, he'd studied hotel management. You know, he was mm-hmm. ready to take over. And uh, I said, bye-bye. I've worked for you all these years. It's your turn now. Actually, Beautiful. did very well. Uh-huh. And because we had the ranch and the Golden Door, so right, we had a right. big job. You had the Golden Door as <laughs> yeah. well. Yeah, we had a yeah, big yeah. job. But the ranch had a lot of trained staff, and it worked beautifully. In any case, I went to Washington, and I was very fortunate. I worked for a year and a half for U.S. United States Information Agency, and then was able to get my own agency. And I ran the Inter American Foundation as president and CEO of a federal agency for six years. And it trained me in a whole, in the world, in a whole, I mean, I really knew the spa business, I knew this, I knew management, and I knew a lot about the needs of the poor because working at the ranch, I had been involved in, Ticati only had 400 people. Mm -hmm. Now there's 175,000, but at that time, (laughs) there were 400 people and they were very poor and I worked with them and did a lot of, I was a special delegate for Save the Children Federation, and I brought them to Mexico, and I worked, had (laughs) arranged a lot of things in Mexico, which was my home at the time. Anyhow, so I went to Washington and was able to put all these skills to use and ran this agency and then started something called Eureka Communities, began in Detroit with seed money from the Kellogg Foundation, they gave me 75000 if I went to Detroit. I said, okay, I'll do it in Detroit. I mean, I applied. I, was planning, I wasn't planning Detroit, but that's where... That's where the money was. <laughs> okay. And, I, and uh, then subsequently raised for Eureka 11 mil, $14 million in 11 years. It was very successful. Until one day the Ford Foundation said, this is working so well, Deborah. We're going to do it ourselves. We don't need <laughs> Eureka. And it's now around the world, the methods, methodology. Tell, tell us about the Eureka Foundation. Tell us what you created. Um, there are variations. The International Youth Foundation says it's the only thing that works with Arab and African youth. But variations is all are, are, are every place. It's basically bringing together CEOs of community service nonprofits. Mm-hmm in which they have to meet monthly. They actually have to have a letter of permission if they're sick. I mean, they can't send anybody. Mm -hmm. They have to be the CEO. And at each group, there was only one for one that deals with food and one that deals with housing and one that deals with employment and one that deals with illness. And I mean, so that they all together have all the skills. Right. I had tables of seven, but now the tables go as much as ten. But you only have one from each need. Right. One One would deal with aging. Terrific. And they work every month discussing and seeing where they can combine, where they can get together. There's so much duplication. Right, where it's overlapping and how can we share resources. And And so as a result, a... A Eureka group, and under whatever name it's still used today, you know, because it's all over the place, they, by combining forces, mm-hmm. are much more, have greater yeah, impact absolutely. than each one working alone. And so there's different community foundations do this and that, but this is specific. You sit together and you look at the problems so together you're a new whole. Right, and you connect the dots. Yes, exactly. Do we have one here in San Diego? There are various variations. Uh, at one time, yes. We, at, what I had and was funded, that's why I raised the 14 million in 11 years, was then I had in San Diego two staff, I had in Detroit, I had in Boston, I had in LA, I had in San Francisco. The only one that still runs as the everything is in 
Berkeley, I mean uh, Oakland. And uh, that one still exists. You know, uh, we, we have a foundation called Miraglow, which works for the underserved. And it often occurred to me, before I knew you actually did this, uh, why aren't we all connecting together yeah. to share the resources and uh, help each other and pull, to, to pull up the whole community? Yeah. And it's exactly what you created, Anyhow. which is powerful. Anyhow, it worked very well. And uh, I think, in any case, I did that. And I did something that probably has the greatest impact. I, did a, I ran for Congress, didn't make it, but decided what Congress needed was management. And I did a management manual that's now in its 14th edition. And the Congressional Management Foundation is actually paid by Congress plus other people to do seminars and classes, and we do uh, you know, in about 60, 70 different activities every month in training Congress staff, not the congressmen. The staff, men, how, how to run the, the staff. office, basically. And as a result, uh, the Congress Congressional Management Foundation, which is funded by many good organizations, uh, has made Congress efficient, effective, from the so, bottom, not the top. Not the top. So, We're from the bottom up. So your manual, still used today, yeah. by Congress staffers basically to run the office and sit. That's unbelievable. And, and to make progress in their educating and training. And it's just, we're training. We're totally non-political. We work right. with Democrats okay. and Republicans both. All right, you're a good bipartisan uh, yeah. colleague there. <laughs> Tell us, a, tell us a bit about Wellness Warrior, because uh, this uh, is extraordinary as well. Well, Wellness Warrior, I'm leaving, going to be leaving it on its own. I put too much time in <laughs> that I don't have. Wellness Warrior had a wonderful plan, and it wasn't able to make it. I had hoped that I would be able to get the top writers and thinkers to all come together. Mm -hmm and form an organization in which they would all bring their people, uh, their readers, their thing, to making some major, not, not everybody repeating the same thing, but bringing the best together. And I thought down the road we could even do a march on Washington saying we want wellness. It, it may not be too late because the Academy for Integrative Health and Medicine is thinking this way. Good. So we, we, it may not be too I late. I wish you well. Yes. And we'll, we'll have you in the front of the line. <laughs> that I can tell you. But truly, um, <laughs> the government is set about making people sick. What we're doing in subsidizing everything that makes people sick. Uh, you know, beef is subsidized 70% uh, through the various kinds. And we are supporting a system that is destroying our land, our soil. Um, we're growing 85%, 83% to be accurate, of all the land in the United States is used for corn, both for ethanol and for cattle feed, and, and soy. And, right, and, and, instead, uh, and as a result, they're using monoculture, the same thing year after year. And because the land gets tired, they're using artificial fertilizers. And we're literally destroying the soil of our country. I mean, when you destroy the soil, that is dis real destruction. So That's, anyhow, we're doing a lot of bad things. You know, it's uh, striking to me uh, that people don't get this interaction of the health of the planet and human health. And yeah. I think most people don't realize when they go out and they buy a cheap piece of beef that that beef came from an animal KFOS, that the animal's been fed things like uh, other corn animals. and soy and other and, uh, animals, uh, and that 75% of our antibiotic industry is going to yeah. 
exactly. uh, livestock. Yeah. And I just don't think people understand and this. And you're eating it. Right. And when you eat Ex meat, you're eating the right. livestock. So I always say to my patients, if you're going to eat an animal, ask the question, what did the animal eat? Right? What did the animal eat? Because ultimately, as well that's, put. That's, Very what, well put. that's what you're we'll eating. And uh, I, I think we're missing, I really, I'm so glad we can touch on this for a minute because I think we're really missing the big picture as to what's going on. You know, we have a climate that's changing. We have 3.5 billion of the poorest people in the world who are suffering the most, quite frankly, for what we're doing to this planet, for the, for the more affluent, right? The people of privilege. And, um, and they're eating the good food. Absolutely. They're not eating fast food. They're not right. eating... But I feel, and even more than that, I really feel that the suffering of the animal contaminates the meat. Totally. That I animal agree. who spends that time in the feedlot cooped up, or right. that chicken who never sees the outdoor and breathes the contaminated air from the time it's born till it's mercifully killed. Absolutely. Because they're built, they have huge sealed buildings where when you go in to pick up the dead chickens who died from this or that, they wear hazmat suits. You right. don't go in because then your skin peels and you get diseases. Slaughterhouses are awful places. Feedlots are awful places. So vegetarianism. Uh, I'm with you, vegetarianism. And, you know, as a matter of fact, when you look at greenhouse gas emissions, you know, we have to start looking at the planet. The agricultural industry accounts for probably about 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions yes. that we have. And the World Economic Forum talks about this. And so we really, we, you know, when we start talking about meatless Fridays, meatless Mondays, you know, meatless every day, uh, not only is it good for human health, it's good for planet health. It's it really important. a lot of the problems of the world. It would solve an enormous. If we enormous. became vegetarian. If we, exactly. The cow does most of the methane, gas, the cows, and the planet can't cope. The planet's not coping, uh, which is why we're seeing uh, high levels of toxins today. I mean, we're seeing more mercury and heavy metal toxicity than we've ever seen, and it's coming in the air. You mentioned we have a depleted soil, so we're seeing mineral uh, deficiencies. We have antibiotic resistance because of the yeah. antibiotics that we're giving cattle. Uh, yeah. People are not making these connections, and uh, it's really quite clear. And I have to, I have to say that um, I'm, I'm proud that Dr. Ramanatham, who's our local science expert here uh, at Scripps Oceanographic and is the advisor for Pope Francis, uh, has been trying to raise, through Pope Francis's message, raise the level of awareness about all of these issues. It's wonderful, I didn't know that, that's great. I think it's, I think it's critically important and I really sal salute their work. So what would you say, if you had to leave us with three, because I believe in threes, the rule of threes, uh, if you had to leave us with three thoughts, uh, what, would you, what would you advise? Well, I always, the people say, bring up three and I always say five. Okay, then do five. <laughs> First is, the, if you want to have a long, healthy life, first, you have to pick an environment that is conducive. That, that it means that you work to be not financially <laughs> impoverished, but that you live in a decent environment. Environment comes first. Then second comes community. Your community, your friends, your family, the people around you. Your you don't tribe. Live your tribe. Yeah. And only then comes exercise and food and finally faith. You are better with all five. But you can manage without faith, but you can't manage without the other four. Right. Well, you can't manage without clean water, clean air, a, play, a, a roof over your head, or a tent that you can, <laughs> <laughs> that you can go into. Uh, Absolutely. And for the planet, what would you say? We're in such great danger. It's, it's hard to say. I truly worry what two or three generations will find 
whether they'll be walking around with gas masks, like you see in some of the science fiction movies. I just hope, because I can't help but be an optimist, life has been good to me, that wisdom will prevail. And we all, everyone, has the opportunity to be the change that we want to see. Yeah, exactly. And no one else can do it. So we have to do it. If everyone contributes their small piece, it can make a huge difference. Thank you. And being a vegetarian, we heard you say, is one. Walking instead of driving. Getting rid of all the plastic. Yes. I mean, there are some things we could do right now that can, that can have a huge impact. Even just cutting down on paper towels. A little simple thing. You'd be amazed what would happen. Yeah, and even take, <laughs> take a shorter shower as well. Yeah. <laughs> Anything you'd like to say before we finish? I think Mimi's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> well, it's a no, joy. You, you are my mentor, <laughs> and I am deeply inspired, and... Uh, I, can, I can do my small, small part in getting your the message out to uh, as many people as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've had, it's a joy. Thank you.